Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me on today. My name is Dr. Grace D. Gibson, an assistant professor in Africana Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. I want to first give a thank you, a huge thanks to Auburn Avenue Research Library for this opportunity to talk with you all. To all my students who every time I teach this speech provide me with new perspectives, and to those who uh, at the first time hearing it, and for those that have heard it before, welcome for this journey and this, um, this time. Also to all my professors and mentors who have shaped me into the scholar who I am today, and who in many ways enlightened me and brought, me, brought my attention to this Frederick Douglass speech. To my family and to my friends for the love and support, you all truly all make this worth uh, what I'm doing. So let us begin with this 4th of July is yours, not mine. Let's talk independence. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. Understanding Frederick Douglass's what to the slave is the 4th of July. So let me start out with telling a quick story about who I am and why this speech is pretty relevant and important to, to discuss. So I grew up in Champaign, Illinois, which is pretty much known as a college town in the Midwest. Uh, during this time, you know, Fourth of July would be very much seen as barbecues with family and friends. Occasionally, depending on the weather, if it was too hot, um, we would go to the city parade. And even on occasion, I even actually participated in the parade as a marching band member of my high school. And even, you know, at the end of the day, closing out with the fireworks, we would either go to the front yard of my uncle Oscar's house or at the assembly hall on the University of Illinois campus. The 4th of July in many ways for me was a, a holiday of celebration Maybe not so much the celebration that many of us are thinking about, but for us, it was just a time to gather a time to be with friends and family, sometimes even travel to go somewhere and enjoy all that it had to offer. Now, I'm going to be honest with you here. I would take part in many of these activities, not really being patriotic. Let's be clear about that. It was more just about simply the participation of it all. In my mind, I really was just thinking about how it was a day off, some time that I maybe got to get a little bit of extra sleep and a time to really just simply hang out with my family and friends during the summer break. But there was a small part about it that I knew the core of the 4th of July was not really a holiday for me as a Black woman or even just simply as a Black person. I was not celebrating the holiday in the same way and spirit as many of my fellow white Americans. Even in the midst of this curriculum that is sadly very much limited and even tested and so much wanting to be butchered and taken apart or forgotten, many of the material forgotten, I knew that the Declaration of Independence was signed July 4th, 1776. The Emancipation Proclamation was issued on January 1st, 1863. And although some did not even get this message until June 19th, 1865, which means there was almost 87 years and some change and a gap there, and for others almost 89 years before black people would even be able to take part in this alleged freedom and independence that keep in mind we are still fighting for and seeking out even today. And as we know, the history books have unfortunately and continue in many ways to still glaze over many of these significant moments. Um, and even one of those being Frederick Douglass's speech and have made it to seem as though through all, all people have been granted this freedom and that the message was supposedly passed to all states. But, but as noted by scholar and professor Derek R. Spires, the 4th of July is a, quote, day of supposed celebration that should actually be a, of a national mourning because the nation's promise has fallen short. It should not be a day of covering up with symbols and celebrations, a revolution fought and won because it's not done yet, end quote. I think Dr. Spears says it very best there. It is not necessarily a day of celebration, but simply really a national day of mourning. 
So very quickly, I became what many would say is, you know, maybe that student who's always asking the question or that child who is always wondering why. Um, and the simple question would be, and so why are we celebrating the 4th of July? And you really do understand that this isn't really our independence, right? And if anything, as we are today, we should be celebrating Juneteenth. As the Black activist Martin R. Delaney would say, true patriotism and love of country requires critique. And listening and reading Douglas's speech ensured me that I was not crazy and that the little voice in my head was trying to speak out on something and that the critique does matter and that we should listen to it. So it was not until my senior year in high school at Centennial High School in Champaign, Illinois, and even further when I got to college in Atlanta, Georgia at Clark Atlanta University, that I got this full larger picture of July 4th and the Frederick Douglass speech of his 1852 speech. The now titled, What to the Slave is the 4th of July? It truly blew my mind in so many ways. And at the same time, even intrigued me because there, here was a speech that asked the question that I had been always asking and even still in this moment ask. Plus offering this, what I like to think of as a pre-emancipation diatribe. Thus, I felt like I had really hit that mega million, had really hit, you know, uh, that big lot of whichever one you may play if you do, uh, when I was introduced and told about Douglas's speech. Afterwards, I immediately made it so that I wanted to post it on my social media networks. I wanted to reiterate the fact that this needed to be talked about. It needed to be known. And even on July 4th and on July 5th, considering that is the actual day in which he gave the speech. And once I became a university professor, it immediately made it to my syllabus, particularly when I would teach Introduction to African American Studies and Black Popular Culture during the summer sessions. It was though, I'm trying to play catch up. I'm trying to make sure that the learning that was maybe not there during my K through 12 learning, and maybe for many other students during their K through 12, that this was something that was not going to be missed, that was not going to be overshadowed, minimized, or even worse, ignored. I did not want my students that came in contact with this to not have this knowledge of this pertinent speech that was important to not only Black history, but also American history. So let us go, in a way I would say, a rewind and a fast forward. So for a period of time, I actually had the opportunity to spend some time in Rochester, New York. And I remember one of the first things that I immediately did was want to go to the actual place, Corinthian Hall, where Frederick Douglass gave the speech. Now, unfortunately, the hall itself is not there, but there is a landmark, an actual statue of Frederick Douglass in this place. So one can actually somewhat imagine being there, seeing him in all of this amazing glory, say this, this very striking, poignant speech to the people of Rochester, New York. And so, like I said, immediately in those few weeks, I made sure that was one of the first and things to see and to make sure that I got to take part of. To be in this presence, it was as if, and many times where I felt the ancestors and other places, I definitely felt the spirit of Frederick Douglass in that moment. And it was almost overwhelming and mind blowing at the same time. It is not often that you get this opportunity to visit landmarks and spaces that have been so historic and that have such a, um, a momentous moment and a momentous occasion. For me, in many ways, the questions that I was asking, the thoughts that I was having were able to come full circle and I was able to really be in the moment. And so as it is noted, it was not an occasion to per se celebrate, but one more so to remember. And so it's 1852. The Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society have chosen Frederick Douglass to give the address at their 4th of July meeting. And so in many ways, I'm sitting here thinking, do they really understand or really realize what is about to transpire? What were they expecting of Douglass to do or to say um, during this 4th of July meeting? 
And in turn, Douglas would ask the prominent Rochester businessman and abolitionist Samuel Drummond Porter to also participate and take part in this celebration. So let's, you know, set the scene here and let's take a, you know, note of some important things that are, are happening. So it's the 1850s. The abolitionist movement was not really per se widely received within the United States. And while many Northerners were anti-slavery, they were not necessarily pro-abolition. For many, this was seen as too extreme, dangerous, and even so radical. In essence, they were very comfortable with letting the Southerners continue to hold slaves, a right that they believe was supported by the Constitution. Here, and we must keep in mind, who is this Constitution for? And is everybody in mind and in thought when this Constitution is in place? For them, it was a matter of not wanting slavery to spread to areas where it did not exist. So if it was already existing somewhere, it was fine there. Just let's make sure it doesn't spread any further. But yet, Douglas's purpose with slavery, um, with the speech, excuse me, was to not only convince the unjust nature of slavery, but to have the abolitionist movement become more acceptable to the Northern whites. Although the event that was taking place was sponsored by the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, it was a celebration of the July 4th anniversary. Also, Frederick Douglass was the main highlight of the celebration. So once again, keep in mind, we are talking about a national celebration of the 4th of July. Frederick Douglass, this black man is giving a speech and is the highlight, the keynote one might say of this celebration. And so in addition to having the speech being given, the speech was also reported and reprinted in the Northern newspapers, along with it being published and sold as a 40 page pamphlet. So since the fourth at this time in 1852 fell on a Sunday that year, they decided to have the event on the following day. Interesting that that would take place and makes me even wonder why not to celebrate it on the fourth if there's such this grand celebration that wants to take place. Basically, the buzz around the town was that the entire event was to focus simply on Douglas and what he would have to say and bring to the table here. So on July 5th, 1852 in Corinthian Hall in Rochester, New York, the abolitionist Frederick Douglass would deliver one of the most impassioned and moving speeches to an audience of over 500 to 600 people. Now that may not seem like a lot right now when considering we might go to somewhere and there's tens, thousands and thousands of people attending. But at this time in 1852, 500 to 600 people was a big deal and was huge and massive. Now, this is all before the tweets, the IG posts, the Tumblr reel threads, the TikTok posts, and any other maybe even virtual presentation like the one that is happening right now. This was a long form oratorical speech and was considered at that time high art form. And on top of that, during this time, Independence Day was considered the ultimate form for a speech. But once again, let's keep this in mind. Imagine this free black man, one of few, was giving a was given free reign, free reign now, to speak on his thoughts to this all white audience during this Fourth of July celebration. Let me repeat that again: an all white audience during this Fourth of July celebration. I can only begin to imagine what this all white audience was expecting and thinking was going to happen. And even wondering what Frederick Douglass was thinking before even opening his mouth to say these words that would come out. And maybe even wondering, why am I the lonely, the sole black person here giving this speech on independence and freedom? The rhetoric scholars, Robert Heath and Damian Waymer would speak on Douglas's speech saying, calling it a paradox of the positive. This was in fact due to that it would highlight how something positive 
and meant to be positive, in this case, the Declaration of Independence, can also very well and very much does exclude many individuals. So let us see what Mr. Douglas really has to say, and let's take a moment and dive into some of the significant passages of his speech as noted in his papers. Mr. President, friends, fellow citizens, he who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shriekingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. The task before me is one which requires much previous thoughts and study for its proper performance. I know that apologies of this sort are generally considered flat and unmeaning. I trust, however, that mine would not be so considered. Should I seem at ease, my appearance would much misrepresent me. The little experience I have ha had in addressing public meeting in country schoolhouses avails me nothing on this present occasion. The papers and the placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way, for it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence, but neither their familiar faces, nor the perfect gauge I think I have of Corinthian Hall seems to free me from embarrassment. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable, and the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. You will not therefore be surprised if in what I have to say, I evince no elaborate preparation nor grace my speech with any high sounding exordium. With little experience and with less learning, I have been able to throw my thoughts hastily and imperfectly together and trusting to your patient and generous indulgence I will proceed to lay them before you. Whew. Now in this moment, knowing the audience is very familiar with the subject matter regarding 4th of July speeches, Douglas is bypassing having to explain its significance. He doesn't need to do that. Douglas is also doing this sort of balancing act of not acknowledging his limited experiences but also note that he has spoken before several times in this space of the Corinthian Hall to very similar audiences. On one hand, he is putting on a display of humility while at the same time he's establishing what might say is this authority as a speaker and justifying why his presence is here at this platform. He's also reminding the audience that he wants also too was a slave and calling attention to the fact that a slave has been invited to speak on this alleged freedom. This is a strategic method from Douglas in which he employs irony. It's a strategy that he will use throughout this entire speech to emphasize a variety of particular specific themes. I like to think that with this opening, he is setting up his audience he is preparing his listeners for a display of learning. They, in many ways, are the students. He is the teacher. He is also uh, providing learning and rhetorical skills. And this is a feat quite beyond the capacities of what was seen as an inferior being. So let's go back to a few more of his words. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This to you is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance and to the signs and wonders associated with that act. And that day 
This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. There is consolation in the thought that America is young. Great streams are not easily turned from channels worn deep in the course of ages. They may sometimes rise in quiet and stately majesty and inundate the land, refreshing and fertilizing the earth with their mysterious properties. They may also rise in wrath and fury and bear away on the angry waves, the accumulated wealth of years of toil and hardship. So what I like about this particular passage here is his repetition of the words, your and you. He is, you know, essentially giving this startling emphasis on the distance between himself and his audience, and even incorporating religion, Christianity, God in this, because God was often used and spirit in Christianity specifically was particularly used um, during slavery. And so he is signaling to the listeners, the audience, that he does not share their perspective or their attitudes towards this 4th of July. Yet, he is taking some hope from the fact that the country is young. The time, as he mentions, it's only 76 years old. The destiny and the character are not per se fixed, so there's room to grow. There is room to flourish, one might say, to improve. These are things that even in 2022, unfortunately, there's still much growing, much flourishing that needs to be done. Thus, it may yet change and abandon slavery. We can really only hope for this. Although slavery is officially abolished um, right now in 2022, there are still mental ideas of slavery that are still existing. And so by Douglas using this idea of great streams as a metaphor, it can also serve as a warning regarding the notion of whether America continues to permit slavery, to continue to permit injustice, prejudice, all of those and above. If so, the nation could be dismantled morally, broken and shrouded trauma and sorrow. But he has more, let us see what he says here. But such is not the state of the case I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak to you today? This passage is really quite self-explanatory as Douglas makes it very, very, very clear that this holiday has not been inclusive of him and other African-Americans. The inheritance of what he specifically says as justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence has not even remotely been afforded to him and others. But he continues to tell them further, fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose claims heavy and grievous yesterday are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, May my right hand forget her cunning and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then fellow citizens is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view 
standing there identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine. I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declaration of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally in hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Now, early on, Douglas notes how he, has one, he was once enslaved and the same tone is brought back up again. He's reiterating in the speech on the 4th of July is not coming from a Northern white perspective, but one of someone who has been enslaved. This very scathing passage, passage is where we see Douglas highlighting the wrongfulness and ugliness of slavery. As he notes, quote, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. Douglas is not telling them what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. And here, once again, Douglas is making sure to note how you asked me to come speak to you about this 4th of July, this supposed celebration. But here, I'm going to give you a lesson. Here, I'm going to tell you what you are missing or maybe what you are denying to want to see. He further states, standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will in the name of humanity, which is outraged in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can command. Everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America, I will not equivocate, I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation, as embodied in two great political parties, is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three millions of your countrymen. This is here where Douglas is offering one of his strongest illustrations of the ways in which America is truly false to the ideals it has set for, set for itself. The ways in which Americans practice their politics and religion are very much inconsistent with the values and the ideas they are claiming to be following. He is very critical of the church in which he accuses slaveholders of using the Bible to justify the subjugation of those enslaved despite the tone that is implying freedom for all people. Remember, we had heard him say this and state this earlier. And we all know that this is not the case here of this implying freedom. For Douglas, the church could have played a larger part in the abolition of slavery. So I leave you with these last words from him in the speech. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened and the doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began with hope. And even in his critique and stinging denunciation of the country, Douglas still seems to have this idea and remains hopeful and even wants the audience to really not leave feeling depressed and hopeless. He's looking to the past and the ideas that have been expressed in the Declaration of Independence, but also he's noting that the nation's founders are great men for their ideals of freedom, ideals of freedom that is. But in doing so, he wants to bring awareness to the hypocrisy of their ideas with the existence of slavery on this American soil. And so essentially these ideas, you know, if the nation can live up to them, make the United States, even despite its many flaws, a place of promise, a place of hope. 
for those who have, are enslaved. And so I am trying to feel, and I must say that this feeling is really, you know, one that does translate into 2022. Douglas's feelings and thoughts very much are seen and felt by many, um, maybe are not as hopeful, but maybe some do see that a possible change can and should take place. And although some may still take this approach, others are not so amiable in this. Considering this speech was done in a more intimate setting, the delivery now must have a wider reach and it has to address more than just Northern elite whites. And so if we take a note of the fact that it was 11 years after Douglas gave this speech before the Emancipation Proclamation signed in 1863, two years later in 1865, when as we know, the news finally made it to Texas. And even still freedom and independence seem like fruitless and very much still empty words. Douglas still, I repeat, has this sense of hope. And even I in some ways have a degree of hope as well. But there is still this lingering fear of black life because it, its freedom is always so viciously being snatched away. And it's not even just adults, it's children that it's being taken away at very young and quick moments. If we are to consider the current and social, political and economic climate, especially for African-Americans, Douglas's speech speaks volumes on the way America interprets freedom just think about us, our celebration of Juneteenth and the many ways and factors in which we have to still have this discussion that because a message was not sent, uh, freedom was not given, it was taken away for two years from those who deservedly and should have had it. The fact that many elections are in place right now and that many people, many states and the freedom of African-Americans in particular and those of color are in jeopardy due to transitioning or maintaining of certain powers in there. It was and is an appreciated effort, um, but this is just the beginning here of what Douglas is speaking to. Think about it. When children are having to hide when they are having to watch parents, friends, those being taken away from them right in front of them in their very own eyes. The fact that those are having to uh, wonder, am I safe? Is it safe to go to school? Is it safe to just walk in my own neighborhood? Is it one, am I safe to appeal? Or is it, am I safe to go and protest? because one is just not sure if they're going to be able to come home or if they will be, as we know, choked to death, or they will, as we have to hear through song and dance, have to plead that they just want to live or that they are, as we have to remember, confronted and taken out in their own home like Breonna Taylor. Freedom is coming at a cost and it is continued to be laced with trauma. With Douglas's speech, he wanted to also provide this other picture, this viewpoint about the strength, the skills and the brilliance of African-Americans, something that is very much amplified today here in 2022. However, in the antiquated mindset of many white Americans who believe that African-Americans were and are inferior, Indeed, less than fully human does not change the fact that when we as Black people are constantly facing an uphill, steep battle. However, what can be done to continue to dismantle these notions is us educating ourselves to be informed, to tap into our anger, to listen to the joy and express the joy to also uh, realize that there is and can be a fight for social and racial justice. And while I am admiring many of the corporations who are taking part in these matters of justice for African-Americans, who on many occasions who are actually putting their money where their mouths, who are actually making legal changes, who are actually changing policy, because that is where it really matters. That is where the change is taking place. Um, I just hope that these are not meant to pacify uh, for the moment. 
and know that dispelling these notions and taking part in these actions is a daily, an hourly, a minute task and something that Douglas was seeking to do on that Monday morning in 1852 and even every day after. So in addition, Douglas' speech, like many other speeches, becomes a part of what I have mentioned and said before on occasions to be a part of what Dr. K. Whitehead demands as this emancipation curriculum. And this cannot be simply relegated as a footnote. My hope is that a speech like Douglas becomes just as familiar as the Declaration of Independence. And I really actually feel as though it is. Um, just this past February, uh, HBO Max uh, featured uh, this speech as well as several other speeches from Frederick Douglass. So there is this mainstream notion of understanding the question that Douglass was posing and many other questions that he would pose about freedom, justice, uh, the right to just exist and be. And so there will be other noteworthy speeches that are many included in my teachings and many that some may, you all may know, and if not, definitely should take a look at, including that of Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman, to also Mariah Stewart's Why Sit Ye Here and Die, to Ida B. Wells Barnett's Lynching Our National Crime, The Ballad or the Bullet from Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer's speech at the 1964 DNC to Barbara Jordan's Who Then Will Speak for the Common Good? And many, many, many others that should be listened to, read, just brought into your system, brought into your thinking, into your uh, way, your purview. And even, even with Douglas pointing out how America was built on these inconsistencies and this hypocrisy, we still have to remind America that Black people are human, something that I often have to ask why we have to do this, but yet it is something that has to be done because there are people who still are fearing Black bodies just existing, fearing that Black bodies are terror, fearing Black bodies are doing something wrong just for simply walking down the street, coming out of your home, going to school, giving a speech just for being a Black American. And so here I am reminded of something that Ella Baker has always spoken of. Until the killing of Black men, Black mothers, sons, and we definitely must and have to include Black women and daughters becomes just as important to the rest of the country as the killing of white mothers, sons, or daughters. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until this happens. And so if one does not hear or understand these words from Douglas in 1852, I, among many others before me, and even now, do not have this problem with resharing the message with a very maybe different delivery. Long gone are the niceties of us wanting what the father, founding fathers did because once again, they didn't have me in mind. The fact that we are still having this conversation and it's something I tell my students, we still continue to have to have this conversation over 160 plus years later, means this message has not made it to everyone. Freedom is very much tangible but we have to dismantle racial prejudices, white supremacy. We have to confront it. We have to make clear that whiteness cannot be centered while blackness is truly erased. So as we approach July 4th and even so July 5th, think about what the holiday stands for for you, who it stands for and what will you really do about it? One thing that remains is something that Douglas would note and very uh, pointedly say, this 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. And as for me, I will probably do the same thing that I did growing up in that little old Midwestern town, but now here in Richmond, Virginia. But I always continue to have a clearer purpose and it becomes even more and more clear with each passing year. 
It will be another day that I get to be with family and friends. It will be a day of hopefully, hopefully staying cool in the Richmond heat. And it will be another day to share Douglas's words with my students. And it's also another day that I get to fight for true freedom. And on this day in of just July, 2022, I'm gonna revise the question. And I kind of stick with this question each and every time of what Douglas is posing. And I ask, what to the black American is the 4th of July when freedom is conditional and even tentative and always subject to change? So know this, and I leave in these words and in this moment here, that our black lives will always matter, that your freedom, my freedom, everyone's freedom is always going to matter. You exist, black people are in the future, and that simply our futures are going to matter and must matter if we are to make a change and if we are to even attempt to begin to answer the question that Douglas is posing. Remember, it is a holiday for some to celebrate, and it's also a holiday to remember. It's a holiday, as, um, as mentioned earlier, of national mourning as well, as we must think about what comes with celebrating this day and who gets to really actually take part in it. So I leave you with being safe, being healthy, being aware. Don't be fearful. Know that you have the joy and that you can express that joy, even if at this time of what is taking place was not meant or was thought of you in mind with it. And we can't give up on what it is that uh, we are here for and meant to do. I thank you and remember what to you is the 4th of July. <laughs>